You can grab your Bible and turn to Isaiah 6. Would you do that? We'll get there in a moment. Uh, everyone watching online, do the same. We've got a lot of people who are out today, a lot on our team and others who are either been exposed or COVID or protocols. And so a lot still happening in, in that regard. But uh, now we can just be set free to focus in on the Lord uh, and his, his fame, his glory, his holiness. I wonder, have you ever met anyone famous? Think about that. Maybe at various levels or degrees, we've met someone famous. Um, I want to ask you, were you, were you nervous about it? Did, were you prepared to meet him or did you meet him suddenly? Talked to one of our members after the early service who ended up on an elevator uh, downtown alone with Roger Stallback and, and, didn't, like, and didn't say a word like the whole time, rode up, left, and later, like, I didn't know what to say. We get awkward around famous people, don't we? And maybe for some, that, that's really appropriate. I mean, if someone is kind of high level uh, person, like I, I wouldn't, let's, you know, if I was to meet the queen, for instance, um, I probably wouldn't, hey, what's up queen? You know, I probably wouldn't do like I might do with good friends I would see. Um, I wouldn't fist bump her or how about the cowboys? You know, um, probably wouldn't call her Beth. Um, probably wouldn't enter into, you know, kind of like with my high school buddies, like a, a burping contest, you know, how does that, you know, you want to play that out? I don't think I would do that, right? I know I wouldn't do that because it's not appropriate. Uh, if you were to meet someone of, of, you know, like that, you, there are certain people where you should act differently. And so this really begs the question as we approach this line in the Lord's prayer, hallowed be your name. How do we approach a holy God in prayer without being awkward? Do you ever struggle with that? Can we approach him with reverence and joy, with a kind of awe and yet nearness and closeness? How do, how do we live in that tension? And I think this is much deeper than just prayer, or just, or yes, coming to worship. I wonder if you've been aware today, all the words that we've sung, all the, uh, the whole time of worship, have you really been aware of his holiness and then who you are in light of that. Well, we're going to talk about that today. The one thing that separates him from every famous person who's ever lived. He is the most famous, the highest person, capital P. And it's his holiness. We see this in, in context, okay, of the Lord's Prayer. So I want us to say it together. We're memorizing the Lord's Prayer through these days. I've said, let's memorize it in the ESV to give us a uniform prayer. It's not quite the King James where some of you maybe have learned it. But it's not, you know, this kind of the remix, you know, version or something either. It's close to the King James and it's powerful. So let's say it together. You'll see it on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We've noted that the doxology on the end that we sing so beautifully and wonderfully at times is not in the, um, the, the most recent um, translation, modern translation, because it's not in the oldest manuscripts. I think archaeology and such has helped us a little bit along the way. But what does it mean then? Hallowed be your name. What is this? The word we don't use a lot. I like how the, the, um, the ESV keeps it because there's not a word quite like it. So it's still a word, but we don't use it much. We get close to it at Halloween. Uh, Hallows Eve. Hallows is saints. Hallows Eve before all saints day is what Halloween is. So we, we use it there, I suppose. In the Greek, the word is hagios, holy. Uh, the, 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 the verb, I mean, the, the, the form in, in a, as a noun is, is hagion, which means saint or saints. So saints are holy ones, made holy, rightfully understood, by Jesus, not by anything we've done. Climbing a ladder to be named a saint, Christ is the one who makes us holy. The word sanctus, you heard that word sanctify uh, translated that way, but sanctus means holy in, in Latin. And so this, this idea that he's holy, he's holy other, the word means set apart. It literally means cut off, like separated from everything else and certainly from us. 
Albert Haas, who wrote a great book, you can find in our sermon resource guide with um, resources that are, that are used in this message and messages to come. You can find it online. He says this, to hallow God's name is to walk the way of humility as we adore God's presence with the awareness of our sinfulness. Praying the name of Jesus has the power to open us to the experience of unceasing prayer. The Lord's Prayer becomes really a guide for life. Last week we said Jesus told us when you, when we just prayed it, when you pray, pray this way, our Father. We talked about how scandalous that was and, and, and the fact that we're crazy to call God Abba, the name that Jesus would have called his own father, Joseph. Because see, every Hebrew knew the name of God, Yahweh. I am who I am, I will always be. He says in Exodus 3, that will always be my name. Meaning he's always going to be the great I am. So how do you reconcile? And I think it's interesting. Jesus says, call him Father. You have this intimate, close relationship now that will come through Christ. But then he, right on the back of that, he's holy. Declare his holiness. How do we reconcile that? The question really we're coming to here is this. What does it mean that God is holy and how do we respond to his holiness? That's the question of the day. So Isaiah 6, I hope you're already there in this passage, a famous passage we're going to look at today. You'll see um, the the revelation of his holiness, uh, the recognition of his holiness, and then the response to his holiness. First, the revelation of his holiness. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. And, and what I mean by revelation, think about this. The only thing you know about God is what he's chosen to reveal to you. That's all you know about him. And so here he reveals his presence here with Isaiah. Look, he puts it in historical context. In the year that King Uzziah died, that's 739 BC, by the way, we know that. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now it's interesting, always placing things in context. Uzziah was a good king, uh, or, or I should say Judah had a prosperous era, time under his leadership, but he came very prideful as happens to leaders. So prideful, he went into the temple at a point to burn incense, which only the priest could do. Uzziah ends up with leprosy, spends the last years of his life isolated. The nation is in disarray. Now the king dies. But God is on his throne. I think this is what Isaiah is getting to here. Good reminder for us. Leaders come and go. Governments will rise and fall. Nations will rise and fall. God will always be on his throne. This truth alone should drive us to prayer. Think about that. With all the craziness in your life and my life, this week will be something like this, and you'll be feeling this. You'll be, oh, I'm down and in the dump. I'm excited. I am depressed. I am anxious. And you can come before God who doesn't change. He's the anchor of the soul. Why do we not pray more? Turn to Him. Lord, my life is crazy, but you, you're the same. You never change. That should drive us to prayer. You know, John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. So what does Isaiah see? Well, you see, he has a vision. He sees a vision. And, and he, he sees God's holiness, but God himself, you could say, is, is visibly hidden. We see thrones and robes, if you know this passage, we can see smoke and all kinds of things, but he didn't actually see God. He sees God's majesty on display. And he's in the temple. The Holy of Holies is where God's presence resided in this time. His presence is there. So the, pre- the presence of God fills the place up. And, and he's in such close proximity. He's being edged out by the holiness of God. And the temple was the center of life for the Hebrew. Why? Because worship is the center of our lives. Is it central for you? And, and, and I know we can come into the presence of God anytime, all the time. Praise be to God. His presence is with us. His spirit lives in us. Those of us who've received Christ, we're, we're never far from his presence. But when we gather together in worship, is it central for you? Is it priority? Is it the most important gathering of the week? And if so, then you're here every week. 
You're present and you're ready. Look at what happens. Verse 2. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, these crazy creatures. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Now, this literally means burning ones. These aren't, these aren't precious moments like cherubs. These are, these are seraphim. These are angelic creatures. They're not angels because they don't have a message. Angel is a messenger. They're, they don't have a message. They're burning flames, literally. Balls of fire, if you will, crazy, that, that are just pointing to the holiness of God. They cover their eyes in the presence of the holy. They cover their feet like, you know, when Moses meets uh, God in Exodus 3 and God says, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. They, they cover their feet as if to say, uh, my, my feet have gone places I shouldn't go. Or with Moses, God is saying, I'm gonna sh- I'll, take, I'll tell you where to go. You're going to walk where I tell you now. And in the same way, they're totally given over to God in his presence. And they say, one called out to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. As we sang earlier, even as I see the sun shining into the sanctuary today, the whole earth is filled with his glory, the expression of his holiness. Like a call and response, an ongoing song that never ends. There's a chorus here and the chorus is holy, holy, holy. You may know in the Hebrew to doubling, doubling up words like that is, is to speak superlatives. This is a category beyond categories. Holy, holier, holiest. And as I noted, he's separate. God occup- occupies a space and a moral space that none of us can occupy. He's separated from us. We worship him in his transcendence, in his holiness, and, 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 his, and his holiness is central. It, but it's in harmony with all of his other traits. This is important to note. See, if, if his power, his omniscience, his infinitude, his wisdom, his love and his grace, his justice, his righteousness, if all of those are instruments, then his holiness is the symphony. Holiness is not one of his, his, his traits. It's in all of his traits. So, so Isaiah stands here. And friends, we should consider this. When we worship God, even when we come before him in prayer, it's why, it's why Jesus says, be reminded who he is. And now go on with your prayers. But not until then. He's holy. So God's holiness is like the sun. You know, in our little galaxy, it's central, it's unique, it's a source, it brings life, it can bless and sustain, but it can kill you at the same time. You get close enough. I'm reminded of that great dialogue between Susan and Lucy and Mr. and Miss Beaver in uh, The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Maybe you've read this or know this. She discovers that the Aslan, the Christ figure, is a lion. And Susan says, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And then Miss Miss Beaver says, that you will, dearie, and make no mistake. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Miss Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. He's wholly good. He has a holy love. Look at this in verse 4. The foundations of the threshold, threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. The weight of his presence shakes The place. It shakes the foundations of our lives when we come before his presence. So, the revelation of his holiness, then we move to this recognition of his holiness, because this is our problem. He's holy, but we don't recognize it. It it, it reveals the depth of our depravity. Maybe we as believers, we need to understand more, understand his holiness. The closer, I've thought about this this week, preparing this sermon, the more I think about his holiness, the more I'm confessing sin in my life, the more I want, to, I want to turn to him and obey him. His holiness calls us to obedience. 
if we're humble before him, we confess our sin. What's the proper way to recognize his holiness? We come face to face with our sin. It's interesting that, that in our world, people don't acknowledge the holiness of God. People will go about this day and not realize the glory of God is on display in creation and through in one another. We just had several babies that were dedicated before the Lord this morning and everyone is a gift from God. He's sanctified holy before God. Sometimes we catch it, but we don't recognize it. We don't acknowledge it. People don't acknowledge the holiness of God. And yet, it's our sin that is actually, that actually reveals his holiness and should. Often that's why people get to their, their lowest point in life that they finally turn to God. Maybe I messed up. Yeah, you've ruined your life. And in that moment, it's contrasted with the holiness of God. We're so easily dismissive of God. And I think particular in a context of comfort in a place like North Dallas where we tend to miss God's holiness, his presence. We run to other aversions and ways to medicate our pain. C.S. Lewis, again, he offers those famous words, we ignore God even in pleasure, certainly, but, but pain insists upon being attended to. Can't avoid pain. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And most often those pains, not always, but often those pains are brought on by our own doing and should draw us to God. Look at what happens in verse five. His response is spot on. I said, whoa, is me. Now for a prophet to say, whoa, that's a curse. He's cursing himself. I'm cursed, I'm done, for I am lost. The word is, I'm undone, I'm, I'm silenced, I'm, I'm dead. He thinks he's gonna die. For I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm dead. I mean, you might say, I can't even. He's silenced. Sometimes we should be silenced before God in worship and prayer because we don't know what to say and that's appropriate. This is the kind of silence that comes upon a person and that follows a death or a disaster. Same word used in Job where he loses everything. I'm, 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 lost. I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. I got no words. We too should approach God that way at times. And then look at what happens. His response here, he confesses his sin. And that's what God calls us to do in prayer. Lord, you're Abba, Father, but you're holy. When we come to that point in the Lord's Prayer, when you're praying it privately, that should lead us to pause and worship him and, and, and get right before him. And yes, we confess our sin. Maybe it's where we pause there and spend another five, 10 minutes. Then we get back to the prayer. Can I apply this corporately? Do you come to worship as the premier, primary gathering of, in, in the week, most important meeting that you will have throughout the entire week? And do you come prepared? Do you come ready? I've talked to several who pray ahead of time. Uh, you can join others at 8.30 if you're here early or want to come early and pray in our Narthex Chapel. A group praying for God to move among us. Praying for me. Praying for Stephen, for Han, Rolando, all of our lead worshipers. Praying that God will be exalted and that lost people will be saved. Do you come prepared? Because each one of them say, you know, I'm man, I'm ready. I'm ready to worship God. I'm already in. And you can do the same. You see, the dilemma in prayer here, and as disciples, we can't clean ourselves up. Isaiah 64. Isaiah is the one who says, we, we've, we have all become like one who's unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Even our righteous deeds. Friends, consider that. If you don't know Christ today, and even if you do, you can rejoice, but our best efforts are mixed with sin and really just garbage. You say, well, darn, I want to bring something to the table. No. 
In fact, Romans 3.10 says none, none are righteous, not one. And it should terrify us that God knows everything about us. I've said it before. If you're not the most sinful person you know, you don't know yourself very well. <laughs> you're not honest because I know all of my stuff. You know, you may say, well, Jeff, you're our pastor. You're doing good things. My motives are skewed more than I know. And, and, and so it says in Hebrews 4, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Isaiah says, I'm, I'm undone, I'm naked. I, you see everything. It's why Adam and Eve in the garden, they sin, they come, then the presence of God, holy God shows up and they're like, oops, we're naked. How did that happen? You came into the presence of a holy God and the contrast of his holiness reveals your nakedness, your sin. So in our nakedness before him, what do we do? What can I do? Nothing. God must come to us. We need rescue. He's got to come to us and look at what happens. God comes to him. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. God stops the order of worship. Think about this. Rightly do him, all attention to him, the Holy One. He stops it and he brings his attention to Isaiah. What a loving act this is. This is amazing here. What's special about the coal, this is so cringeworthy, isn't it? it, it look at verse 7. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Now, the crazy thing, the special thing is not this is coal or that it's burning, but where it comes from. Don't miss this. It comes from the altar where sacrifices of atonement are made. He says, let me come to you with this. Like Isaiah is not going to run, jump in the jump as a you know, sacrifice himself. He might have felt like it. God comes to him. And again, this is so cringeworthy. It's strange. It's painful. Confession can be painful. But here's the thing. Instead of killing him, God's holiness purifies him. This is what happens, not when we strut into his presence and say, come on and, and, and cleanse me of my sin. Let's do it. No, no, no. When you fall down before him, confess your sin to him. It's that response that then brings God to us and says, now you're ready. And friends, listen, don't miss this. If you've never received Christ, that fire, that purifying fire that comes to us is actually the wrath of God that should have come to Isaiah and every one of us and to you because of our sin, actually taken that on Christ so that God's inflexible holiness and his undying eternal love come together on the cross and salvation is made possible for you and for me. Atonement for you at one with God because of Christ. God did not come to Isaiah because he finally got his act together. He came to him, don't miss this, to, because he just laid himself out and said, I'm undone, I'm finished. And God says, now, now you're going to come alive. If you've never received Christ, friends, that's your thing today. Your sin should not cause you to run from God. I know it feels like, because you're ashamed. Our sin should cause us to run to God. Hallowed be your name. We stay in. But we recognize this is not the end. There's this revelation of his holiness. There's a recognition. And then there's a response to his holiness. Look at this. Once transformed by his love, we live holy lives. Don't miss this. It's not what we come to worship with. It's what we go out with. And so in verse eight, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. Now we often end there. Like, okay, let's, let's sing and we're gonna wrap it up and go. Go now. But we, we don't really ever look at what is he called to do. Well, look at this, verse nine. Go and say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand, keep seeing, but don't receive, what? Don't proceed. He's saying, yeah, go tell them. You're listening, but you're not going to get it. You're, gonna, you, you're, you're looking, but you're not going to see it. This is strange. You know anybody like that? I mean, the people are already too far gone. 
Verse 10, make the heart of this people dull. They're already, they're already gone. Their, 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 their ears are heavy, their blind eyes. Lest they see with their eyes or hear with their ears, understand with their hearts they, they, and turn and be healed. They could still happen, but they're too far gone. This is so defeating for Isaiah. Do you ever feel defeated in your witness? With people, maybe people in your family or people that you work with, they're never gonna hear. God says, don't give up. No, keep going, keep going. Because the, the, the contrast of my holiness up against their sin just might turn them to me. Now look at what he asked then, the appropriate question is verse 11, Lord, how long? How long? Because every, every metric of success for Isaiah's life and ministry, God says, it's going to be a failure. They're not going to listen. But stay faithful. Stay faithful. How long? Well, until cities lie waste without inhabitant, houses without people, land desolate and waste. What? The Lord removes people from far away. They're going to be going into exile in the forsaken places. Are many in the midst of the land and a tenth remain in it, but it'll burn again. The terebinth, which is a, a tree or, or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump, a reference to the Messiah to come. How long until the plan is fulfilled? How long do we stay, Lord, committed when everything else looks like it's falling apart around us? How long until my kingdom comes? Until you leave, uh, breathe your last breath. How long, I can say it this way, as long as your worship doesn't match up with your life, that's how long. How long will things keep going out of control in my life? How long will our society, our culture, deal with the stuff of division and injustice and racism and all the things that we think about on a weekend like this? He's calling us. That was the main problem in Judah, by the way. You look at the old prophets, Amos is one who says, God's done with your gatherings. He doesn't want to hear your music because it doesn't match up with your life. You're not living a life of righteousness and, and justice in the world and, and, and love and forgiveness. How long? Dr. King asked this question in 1965 on the steps of the Montgomery courthouse. He asked Isaiah's question. A great preacher, how long will justice be crucified and truth buried? Not long. Because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long. Because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends toward justice. See, on, on this weekend, we need to remember we're called to love all people. It's why our ministries at, at Vickery are, are focused on people from all over the world, nationalities. It's why we seek to be a bridge. You heard the great news of, of our church plant, a dream that became a reality. It's happening today at Epic Fellowship Church. You know of our ministries that we're involved in to seek to care for those who don't look like us. To bring justice, biblical justice, righteousness, love in the world. Because all people are created in the image of God. The, the sanctity of life, the holiness of each life, born and unborn, black and white, Asian, Latino, every one of us. And I want to offer an opportunity. You heard about one this afternoon if you want to come join us for a great celebration. But on Tuesday night, we have another opportunity for you. And this one's easy. You can go on a Zoom call with me. Uh, Pastor Carter and I are, lead the Dallas Clergy Group. And we're going to be with authors who've written a book called Required. Uh, it's based on Micah 6. Hey, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Uh, all of that's on our website. And the link even to that Zoom call and a gathering. You can just listen in. And we're going to hear from the authors and talk about this. 7 to 8 on Tuesday night. Would love for you to join me. Now, as I close, maybe you've met a famous person. Oftentimes, I did a funeral this, this past week, and, and oftentimes I'll hear um, uh, from friends, you know, getting with family and highlights of their lives. And sometimes I'll hear, well, they met, you know, so-and-so. He worked with, with so-and-so. And, you know, at one time, he'd love to tell a story about how he met. So, and our, our lives are marked by meeting famous people, it seems. 
But always think, when you die, there's only one person. So only one person really matters whether you've met him or not. And his name is Jesus. He's the holy one. He's the one who's come. He's the burning fire of holiness that took on our sin. And now his life, when it touches us, his, his heart, his spirit comes into our hearts and transforms us. And we are made righteous by his righteousness. Therefore, Philippians 2. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him, look at this, the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess, acknowledge, recognize, respond to him that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray together. Friend, if you have never received Christ, maybe you have come to that realization today and maybe even earlier in this sermon, you just said, Lord, come. I I, I need to be changed. I can't rescue myself. And even now, friend, this could be an eternal moment for you to meet Jesus. Give your life to him right now. Say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for me so that I could have eternal life. And for all of us, let us respond to God's holiness by confessing sin, repenting, and actually living now as we go lives of worship before our hallowed God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.